This conference will now be recorded. This conference will now be recorded. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Stamp Chat. It's Friday. I hope everybody's excited. I love seeing a full house. So thank you so much to APS members and stamp collectors and philatelists from all over the world for joining us tonight on Stamp Chat. It's no secret. Uh, we, we've got the big white whale here. Uh, we've got Mr. Graham Beck of the Exploring Stamps, uh, our a YouTube series with us tonight. And he's going to be talking to us about uh, production and the, the ins and outs of what it's like to be a producer of such a great series and you know it and the in this building steps he, he's, he's going to he's going to impress that upon us that it's building steps um APS members it's thank you so much always for joining us and for supporting us I'd like to give a shout out to a, you know the fact that so many of our presenters are APS members to include Graham Peck and I, I want to encourage any of you that have a passion or you know a desire to share, to do so, and to become a guest. That is one way to recruit. That is a call to action. And that that's one more, you know, that that's some energy behind our, our 2020 challenge. So I really appreciate all the members who are coming forth and saying, I want to give a talk. So thank you so much um, for joining us and for, for participating. Friends, um, we, the APS, proudly supports Exploring Stamps. And we know that all of you really get a kick out of it in so many ways. We have had several playlist takeovers, APS playlist takeovers, and they are always sprinkled with Exploring Stamps. Um, they're evergreen content and they're really, really valuable. I know I use them all the time to help people with inquiries with inherited stamps, et cetera. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our guest tonight, Mr. Graham Beck, an APS member. And he will be going, he will be talking about the Exploring Stamps. Friends, if you have questions or comments, go ahead and write them in the chat box. If you would prefer that I read your, your, your chat, go ahead and just put it in a private message to me. Otherwise, at the end of Graham's talk, I'll go back up and then moderate. And so listen for your voice and uh, unmute yourself and have a blast. All right, Graham and everybody, thanks so much. Uh, let's get started. All right, so everyone can hear me and see me, is that right? And my screen? Yes, Graham. Brilliant. Okay, so thank you so much, Heidi. I just want to say thank you to Heidi as well as the American Philatelic Society for inviting me uh, to do this STEM chat. Cool people inviting me to come and talk to other cool people. I think that's brilliant. I'm super excited. Uh, just a heads up or a uh, warning if I get a little animated or too animated or overly enthusiastic. I am a STEM collector after all. It's what we do. I get very passionate about uh, philately and STEM collecting. So as Heidi mentioned, uh, this STEM chat isn't going to be a chat about a particular stamp or a series of stamps or um, the style of stamp collecting. I've made 80 plus videos about that already. You can go watch me talk about them there. In this video, I want to actually talk uh, to you in this stamp chat about the making of those videos, uh, the origin of, of exploring stamps and, and how I got to where the channel is today. Uh, so some of you may have heard of uh, the, the channel before. I've noticed a number of you out there who actually I know as well. So that means you already know who I am. For those of you who don't know me, that's my mug on the, the front page here. Uh, and like Heidi said, I'm Graham Beck. I started this YouTube channel back in 2016. So uh, what exactly is a YouTube channel? I'm just going to quickly, briefly go over this. YouTube channel, well, a YouTube to the YouTube platform is an enormous platform for uploading videos and watching video content. Uh, and I'm using my cheat sheets. Uh, it's got over 2 billion users, making it, if you consider it a social media platform, making it the second largest social media platform. Also, it's considered to be the second largest search engine after Google because more people are using the search bar in that than uh, Yahoo uh, and Ask combined. So it's larger than those. It's second largest search engine after Google. Um, every minute, more than 500 hours of video are uploaded. If you think about that, that's extraordinary. Every minute, 500 hours worth of video is uploaded onto the platform, and over a billion hours are watched every day. 
So there is a tremendous amount of traffic on YouTube, uh, which is an opportunity to promote something, stamp collecting. That's where uh, I came in in 2016. Now, you can go ahead and anyone can go ahead and create videos and upload them. Uh, you can create your own content about anything and you can create your, your own YouTube channel. It's free to do so. Uh, and a channel is really a collection of your videos that you can go ahead and theme and basically people can look for you and subscribe uh, to your channel to constantly watch the uh, latest updates. So you can get uh, YouTube channels based on fixing your car, for instance. Uh, you can find YouTube channels about um, reviewing uh, consumer product goods. Uh, you can find YouTube channels about reviewing your favorite TV shows. Uh, and you can find YouTube channels about coin collecting. But back in 2016, when I started uh, to really rediscover stamp collecting, I couldn't find any solid content on YouTube about stamp collecting. And that was a bit of a concern for me. So what happened when, in 2016, like so many other people, I rediscovered my childhood stamp collection. I had collected stamps as a young boy uh, growing up in South Africa uh, during the early 90s and um, put it away for some time. A lot had changed in my life. I had moved to the United States. I live in New Jersey now. Uh, I had gone to college and so on. And I rediscovered my childhood stamp album, hiding out in, in my parents' attic and opened it up and realized I knew absolutely nothing about the stamps that I collected as a kid. Found them fascinating. One of the things I did was go onto YouTube where I learned how to do everything else in my life at the moment and found nothing about stamps to teach me about how to actually properly collect what exactly philately it was and so on. So I pulled a stamp out at random, very similar to this stamp. Uh, it was a French stamp, pulled it out at random and went onto my smartphone and typed into the search engine, literally I typed in, uh, French, because I knew it was a French stamp with RF, I assumed it was Republic of France, stamp blue woman's head. I typed that into Google, hit search, and bam, I found out there's a boatload of blue stamps from France featuring a woman's head, all having the same weird hat. And very quickly, in just a matter of seconds, I realized that uh, her name was Marion of France. And in minutes, I learned about the Second French Revolution, uh, her some, uh, symbolism around that. Uh, within an hour, I was so um, in, in love with stamp collecting because I'd even learned that uh, the New Jersey State Seal features her Phrygian cap, my own home state seal, and so does Papa Smurf. And my mind was just blown at this point from a smartphone being able to just quickly find out so much about stamp collecting and go through this journey of uh, discovery and uh, learning, I thought, wow, something has changed since I collected stamps as a boy back in the 90s versus 2016. I've now gained access to infinite information and it's really accessible and it's very quick to um, discover or learn about a particular stamp. Back when I was a kid, the best I could do was open up an atlas and maybe figure out where the country was, look it up on, on the atlas and so on, and then really close it and that's it. Now I can really learn, I have access to all this information. So I wanted to capture this. I wanted to be able to bottle up the epiphany I had and be able to present it to somebody else. And since my experience on YouTube was rather dismal, finding any information, I formulated this idea of a, a show that I pull a stamp out at random and spend some time going through and figuring it out and telling a story based on the learnings I had and use stamps to um, make that story something really exciting. And that's the whole concept where I use a box, I pull a stamp out at random. And so the very first episode was just trying to mimic that epiphany that I had uh, with the Marion of France uh, stamp that I pulled from my own stamp album. And so I've made a number of videos since then. Um, like I've mentioned, 80 plus videos. I am now 12,000 plus subscribers and over 1 million views in total of my whole channel. This is a success in the philatelic world because I don't see any other um, uh, videos at the time actually promoting the hobby in the sense that um, I've been trying to do. But it is 
not a success in the world of YouTube. Uh, from a channel standpoint, 12,000 subscribers is really a small amount. Um, and a million views can be attributed to somebody's single video uh, on their channel. So my successes and my lack of successes, I would say, are fairly equal because I've been going on uh, this journey into the YouTube world with stamp collecting and <laughs> figuring it out as I go, and um, and I'm reflecting on it. So I'll be very transparent about my YouTube channel, and I'm looking forward to your questions that I can also answer uh, directly to you and help you out. So from there, let me just. How do I make a video about stamps exciting uh, to the point that I can attract the non-collector? And I started messing around with all sorts of stuff. I think this was season one. The season one, I was playing around with green screen effects and having a lot of fun. I made a couple episodes. Uh, one was this Indian Nat episode, episode 15. And I started to play around with the effects. Uh, also, uh, I think it was um, the Grenadier God episode with green screen and also trying different effects with my own window um, opening it up if you've seen my videos I open up the window and it's a different different place behind it uh, so different uh, styles and approaches and then eventually I started traveling thinking hey why can I why can't I go on set on location and start filming with the stamps so I went to uh, the first image there is the Statue of Liberty I went to three different Statue of Liberties to try and under, um, discover the, the true origin of the photograph that's on the Statue of Liberty stamp. Um, I went to uh, London, of course, learning about Machens. I even swam with the stamp in the Blue Lagoon in Iceland. And then, of course, I used it as an excuse to go have a pint of Guinness in Dublin and drink wine in South Africa. So I started to use stamp collecting as an excuse for an adventure and for a lot of fun. Uh, even if that was to go have uh, um, a bit of uh, beer and wine at, at the odd occasion. But I also started to fall in love with the different elements of photography and cinematography, one of which was flying a drone. And so I purchased a drone and um, took some awesome cinematog uh, cinematography from, uh, from the sky using different drones, uh, different techniques, flying it, learning to use it. Gone to a bit of trouble now and then, had to run away from park ranges and some authorities, which I won't really get into. But I was able to get some good footage, and now I've learned my lesson on what you can. There's a lot of rules out there, by the way, about how to fly, fly a drone. You should read them up before you actually go and fly a drone, which is a lesson learned on my part. Um, but also played with uh, some computer graphics. And so I started messing around with making stamps come to life in the sense that uh, you can, they actually come out of the, the stamp. The imagery comes out of the stamp. That's the Apollo Soyuz episode I did. I think it was season two. Both of these are from season two. Uh, so the one on the left is the Apollo Soyuz. And then I uh, messed around with some uh, cartoon um, uh, animation where I tried to get inside in a Simpsons episode. And so I had a tremendous amount of fun doing this. But I also was trying to connect with individuals that may not necessarily be um, caught into the world of stamp collecting yet, or more so me. I was trying to also interact with people that had a similar mindset to me. And they're curious about stamp collecting. Can they watch it? Can they get excited the same way I can get excited? I made a number of videos, uh, like top 10 videos, having fun with it. I'm pretty busy producing a top 10 video right now, um, and they're always a lot of fun. Uh, and I've also created a number of videos which I've categorized as Philately 101. As I myself have been learning about Philately, I then turn it into a video and publish it. So one of the lessons here is that I, every video is actually me learning about stamp click. I'm not an expert at all. I've been learning as I go. And these videos are showing my progress in my understanding of philately. So the videos you watch today, the season three videos and so on, were really a product of all my learnings from season one and up. And that's what season three was about for me. Season three, I really wanted a um, epic uh, set of videos that really show what I've learned from a cinematography standpoint, a video editing, editing standpoint, as well as a philately standpoint. By this time now, I had gotten a strong grasp of uh, the world of postal history, collecting covers, uh, how to really go ahead and research stamps, 
And so I really put all those efforts into the creation of season three, where I put by far the most energy I've put into anything else in my life. And um, so much so, here's an example, is that for one of the episodes, I think it was the third episode in season three, was about uh, airships and uh, collecting the Zeppelin stamps. I built a the inside of the Hindenburg in my parents' house because I wanted to have a bit of uh, set filming, on set, uh, set filming using some props. And so I built the inside of the Hindenburg based on what I could get from imagery, uh, photographs, as well as watching the Hindenburg movie from the, the 1970s. And then used computer graphics to put in some clouds and so on. So I went a bit far, you could say. Uh, scope control was, was lost at this point, but I was having a lot of fun doing it. And so season three, uh, which is really my pride and joy of the channel, created a number of videos which really taught me a lot about philately. I had a lot of fun from making the um, uh, Apollo 15 scandal episode, uh, learning about covers in that sense, uh, right through to Operation Cornflakes, which was a big deal for me to film. Um, and uh, I think I ended, let's see, I have it up here, the, the um, windmills, chasing windmills throughout Holland, uh, which was just really an excuse for me to have a lot of fun and travel through Holland. So that's all um, what I put into for season three. But what is the level of effort required uh, to make these videos? So this is a rough estimate, but it's it's a good rule of thumb that I use for the my video production, not necessarily um, applicable to anybody else. But this is for my video um, production. One minute of video equals about 10 hours of work for me. And that is not because I'm making well, uh, extremely grand videos. It's because I'm not efficient at it. I'm just a, a simple guy who's not at all involved with video production uh, in my career, as well as I'm not an expert philatelist. So the effort that goes into making one of these videos is tremendous for me. Uh, it starts with researching. I, the researching can involve reading an entire book, along with watching videos, documentaries, surfing the internet for hours on end, and so on. And then goes into building a script. I, I, everything is scripted in my videos <laughs> because um, I, I'm not too good on the fly. So everything is scripted. Uh, and then the video production piece, actually filming, which is my least favorite part of the whole production process, is talking to a camera endlessly uh, and memorizing lines. I'm terrible at memorizing lines. And, um, and then the video editing piece, which can go on for days on end. And so if you think about it, a 10 minute video would be 100 hours of work. Uh, I'm doing this after my job, so this is at night, until all hours of the morning, as well as the entirety of weekends. I don't necessarily have an exciting uh, life outside of stamps and my job, I'm being honest. Uh, but it's also kind of expensive. So about $35 to about 40 US dollars uh, per minute uh, is what I put it at. And that's going based on um, purchasing music, purchasing footage, uh, purchasing any kind of applications to work with the video production. So if there's any kind of add-ons I need to get a particular, a particular type of um, effect, I have to purchase that. Uh, and of course, then there's the purchasing of any props, stamps, and so on going behind the scenes there. So it can be an expensive and very time consuming event. On the left there, I've just got an image of all the posted marks, uh, posted notes that I actually used for season two. So for season two, I pulled all the stamps out over a period of two days. Uh, this was pre-filming of the season. Pulled out all the stamps. Some of the stamps I had to put back in the box because they would have overlapped in topics or I was pulling way too many US stamps, for example. And so I pulled out a variety of stamps and then really knew nothing about them and arranged them using post-it notes in a good order that I thought would, would make for fun uh, learning and, and, um, and a way to promote uh, the, the um, series. And then I, I was just going ahead and checking them uh, putting a check mark if I'd filmed it and moving it up a notch if I'd actually released it. So here I've filmed, I've got six more in the bank to 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 launch. I've got St. George I had to still film as well as the Cape Town episode. Now, what am I using? I use a Canon um, Rebel 
uh, it's just a DSLR, uh, digital single lens reflex. For majority of my uh, person to, um, uh, inter interviewing or really talking to the camera, that's what I'm primarily using. But you'd be surprised that I actually use my smartphone camera a lot for actually in all of it uh, for the filming of stamps on the table or any or filming of the map or any items that are on my table. I'm using my smartphone. And at the time it was an Apple, um, an iPhone 7, and now I think it's an iPhone 10. Uh, phenomenal quality that that I've actually used it for some on-site filming, whereas I didn't bother to take out the the um, DSLR. Instead, I took out the cell phone camera to just film quickly and, and get uh, a, a shot at a location. So it's actually you can start right now using your smartphone if you if you have a decent camera on there. And then from a video editing standpoint, I'm using Apple products. So I've got Final Cut Pro. Uh, it's not a free software; you have to purchase that. But there's a number of free softwares out there that you can look for. Uh, Final Cut Pro in the Windows world would be Adobe Premiere. So they're really comparable uh, and, and very solid video editing. My entire channel, other than I think the very first two videos were filmed or uh, were used, Final Cut Pro. So uh, just doing a quick time check. Cool. So there's a number of challenges I ran into. and. Uh, learned along the way um, how to deal with and some I just still don't know how to deal with so lighting and sound is a continuous problem for me I struggle with it. I get an echo. I try to edit out the sounds um, It's constant struggle and if you go on site uh, You can <laughs> you're really the the, the elements uh, are really um, in your way. So, for instance, the scene in Aruba where I'm filming with a donkey, you cannot hear me at all because the wind is so strong. So I had to um, dub over it the exact wording, uh, and I had to find an outdoor setting that could simulate an Aruban sound <laughs> with light wind and so on to go ahead and do that. And that took hours of my time to really mimic the exact actions of me walking up to the camera and talking and so on. So I'm always struggling with sound. Lighting, I've never mastered. I'm using lights all the time in different ways. Natural light's the best. Uh, but um, in a, in a, when, if I'm filming these things at night, as I said, at 1 a.m. I'm still filming, <laughs> it's, it's impossible. The YouTube algorithm is a challenge that every YouTuber faces. It's basically a piece of artificial intelligence that is deciding on whether or not to promote your video. And so I struggle um, with working with this YouTube algorithm because um, it ultimately picks, is this video worthy of being seen by somebody else? And it decides on who should be looking at this particular video. It goes based on click rate, as well as length of time people actually watch a video before they exit out. Uh, it can go uh, factors on what your thumbnail looks like. And there I am on the right here trying to get a good thumbnail for the Grenadier Guard episode, filming a number of different scenes. But it's, it's a struggle. It, and I sometimes launch a video getting very excited, and then I get very few views. And then sometimes I launch a video, which really I didn't think would, would um, pick up, and a number of views come to it, and it picks up and gets some kind of uh, traction in YouTube. So it's constantly out there, this algorithm. YouTube apparently doesn't understand its own algorithm because it is artificial intelligence, and it's learning as it goes every day. Uh, but uh, if you can crack the YouTube algorithm, you can make a viral video, basically. Copyright content is something you will struggle with uh, in a YouTube world. You must, of course, uh, have your own, um, produce your own content. You can't just copy other people's stuff uh, and just post it and claim it as yourself, uh, as your own material. Uh, so I've had to purchase a lot of music uh, because I use music in my videos, uh, purchase the rights to it, uh, purchase any video that um, is, is uh, stock footage that I'm going to use. Um, or make sure that you work within the fair use uh, world. So if something is, if you're actually um, discussing something and showing uh, a clip from it, you're able to discuss it to some extent without being uh, dinged for copyright. Uh, negative comments, you'll get a lot of it. I've got plenty of negative comments. At first, it was quite uh, troublesome, and then uh, after that, I started to realize that it's just part of the nature of it. I get ne negative emails as well as positive emails as well. Um, 
whether it's people that don't like stamp collecting to people who don't like what I'm doing about stamp collecting. It's once you get over it, it's going to, um, it, it's, it's something you just have to get over it. You, if you haven't uh, gotten a negative comment on a video, that's kind of rare. You're likely to get thumbs downs and, and negative. So just something to warn you if you are going to create videos and start launching them, be uh, willing to receive that. And then making mistakes is going to happen. I've tried time and time again to make perfect videos and I very seldom do where some kind of minor mistake slips through. Either I say something wrong because I've said the line 15 times in front of the camera and the last time I thought it was right, I got the wording wrong to my research led me down the wrong path. And as I'm learning through the making of these videos, there's a lot of misinformation out there. So you've got to be careful. Uh, make sure you find a number of sources that are saying the same thing before you just throw it into, um, into your script and start talking. But that really was the production around it. Now, who has actually seen my videos? Well, uh, this might be a bit of an eye chart if, you, um, uh, if you've got a small screen, but I will talk you through it. The audience from a geography standpoint, the United States gave, gives me 38% of my views. Uh, prime reason is because the United States is a big country, right? And um, also with, with great internet access. So I get 38% of my views from the US. UK gives me 9%. Uh, India gives me 6%. And, um, and then it goes Canada, Australia, and, and it drops down very quickly after that. Now this, I just literally copied, uh, cut and paste this image about two hours ago uh, from my channel. So this is from January 1 to, to yesterday. Uh, so that's who's watching from a male, uh, female standpoint, gender. Of course, it's heavily slanted on the male, 82%, versus female, which has grown considerably over the last few years to 18%. It started at, I think, 7 or 8% when I started the channel. So that's very um, exciting for me. And then an age standpoint, this this is interesting. Um, it's I don't know how accurate the 13 to 17-year-old 17 year, 17 is showing um, point, only 0.3%, point but it's quite encouraging seeing that 18 to 24 is 10%, 25 to 34 is 15%, and it's fairly even from 35 all the way to 65 plus, which is great. It used to be a very sharp bell curve about two years ago where it was all between 35 to 44 being the peak of the bell curve, but now it's leveling out. So that I found very exciting. And so lessons learned, well, from my experience since 2016, making these videos, producing them, key things. One, I have fallen madly in love with stamp collecting, philately. Wow, has it taught me a lot. It's put, given me so much to learn and uh, so much to explore, literally, uh, from adventures to um, trying new things with videos to um, meeting different people in the hobby. It's been a tremendous experience. And so that's my key lesson learned is that this hobby is darn awesome. It's great. Um, other key things, there is an appetite for philatelic videos. Uh, there is an interest in watching these videos. Uh, I don't produce them, I couldn't produce them fast enough, but a lot of people ask for more. Uh, so I recognize that there is a strong interest. I would actually love to watch other videos versus my own uh, instead, because I want more philatelic content out there. So hopefully I can maybe inspire, encourage you all to start producing videos. But um, the other key lesson I learned is that video production is a lot of fun. Um, and I, like I said, I encourage you all to try it if you if you haven't already, if you want to. But um, it is a lot of hard work, uh, it, and the content that you put out there, I highly recommend that you put some effort towards it instead of just filming on the spot using your smartphone right there, saying here's a stamp. I don't know much about it. Give some random facts. It's a great idea to put a little bit of research and maybe even put a little script together or at least formulate what you're going to talk about. It's It, it comes across much more um, interesting in that way. Uh, it's, it's something that people can trust from a content standpoint. Uh, so that is my only ask is that make these videos, but put a little bit of effort, learn about the topic, learn about the stamp, and then teach us teach me more about philately, which I find exciting. 
And really, that is everything I want to talk about. I want to leave some time. I good 30 minutes on the dot there. So I wanted to leave some time to allow you to ask me questions. Um, the one thing is that I do need to step back from making videos now because I've spent a lot of time hunched over in this room, this studio <laughs> that I call spare bedroom in my, my little flat here, um, making videos. As you can tell, one minute equals 10. Uh, hours. So I am going to be stepping back from producing a lot of content. Um, but what I'm hoping is that I'll be able to start watching content from others. I see other channels starting and I'm enjoying them uh, tremendously. I'm thoroughly enjoying them. So I'm hoping that more people out there will be able to start doing something similar, produce videos about stamp collecting. And that is it. Fantastic. Take it. Take in the, the applause, Grant. Take in the applause <laughs> and the thumbs ups. Beautiful. Thank you. I, I, Thank you, know, you for watching. I, I, I think that we can all really appreciate that your candid nature and that you took us to the, you know, you took us through the layers. Um, <clears throat> let's start from the top, friends. So be ready. Listen for your name. Nobody's in a private convo. So you, you get your chance. Um, here we're going to start with James. James, our, the, young, the, the young James. Here we go. Go for it. You're on. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, where did you get um, all of the stamps in the big box? <laughs> That's a good question. So um, a lot of them are from my collection as a kid. Now, one thing that I was terribly bad at was organizing them. So I didn't really have much of a concern from pulling them out of the albums and really just shaking the albums upside down and getting them into the box. I did go while producing, while starting formulating the, the video series, I did buy some additional um, Kilaway and, and loose stamps to put in the box. Uh, but the majority of them are actually from my childhood stamp collection that I just graciously threw upside down and emptied the box. <laughs> yeah. That's a good question, James. Thank you for asking. Uh, we, we have some people talking about green screen. We can open up uh, Casey, Joe, and Penny if you wanted to talk green screen in the chat box. Anybody? Well, I, I tried using a, a green screen for the first time and I think I need more practice with that before I can do anything with it. Um, I I knew how to do it, but I ended up just everything looked green. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. I think I'll, I'll try a different workaround and practice this for later. <laughs> Yeah, when, once you master it, and so I, I messed it up multiple times and half my body was missing and, you know, it, it takes a little bit of while to get it. Uh, there's two components to it. You need a good green screen. So I found out that if it's wrinkly, uh, it doesn't work. There needs to be like no wrinkles in it uh, to, to get best work. And then um, uh, it's all about the video editing software that you can try and, and work with. So um, if you if you want to ping me an email and we can talk about more about how to get your green screen effects working, I can maybe give you some insight. Uh, I'd love to, uh, but um, once you master it, you won't stop green screening, I'm telling you. <laughs> okay. We're at, the chat box is just blowing up. Nicely done, everybody. Gerard, I don't know, do you want to say something, Gerard, about the, the blimp that you love? Oh yeah, I just wanted to say that uh, Hindenburg episode, the Hindenburg episode was spectacular. I was trying to work out how you had achieved that scene where you were sleeping in the airship, and it turns out you built an airship. So it's been great to learn that. <laughs> yeah, so that's where scope went out of control, and I said, you know, let's just build this darn thing inside my house or my parents' house, um, uh, and it didn't just end there because those clouds that were moving by, you'll see that the one window I move in front of it, so I couldn't really use green screen. I had to cut out frame by frame every motion of me so that the, you could see the clouds in the background. So there's your wow. 10, 10 hours per minute <laughs> getting out of control, right? <laughs> Thank you, Joy. Where's the issue now? Uh, it's in pieces. It was uh, burnt in during the winter uh, nicely in my fireplace. Uh, <laughs> 
Otherwise, yeah, I had to dismantle it. I got told to dismantle it in three days after after I used my parents, uh, my old bedroom in my parents' house. <laughs> they told me they wanted it back, so I had to dismantle and burn it. <laughs> <laughs> the utilitarian philatelist, nicely done. <laughs> Melanie Rogers asks, she saw your significant other filming you at the stamp show in Columbus. Would you share how she helps you with the videos? Yeah, so so th there's a problem when trying to film on set is that you kind of need somebody to hold the camera. And my wife has been brilliant at uh, picking up the world of uh, videography using a camera and um, getting me on scene. She's incredibly patient, and I don't know why, because filming on set is oftentimes a disaster. You've got noises happening around you all the time, people walking past you, and then I'm hastily trying to memorize the line, re-say it over and over again. And she, for some reason, has a, has a level of patience that just stands there with the camera and just films me and, and maybe warns me that somebody's about to walk past me and ruin the shot. So um, she, I, I am very appreciative of her, but I know that she also enjoyed the traveling aspect. So uh, yes. she was very eager to get on the plane and, and um, check out Paris, even though it was 14 hours we spent there just to get two shots. So <laughs> she, she's been um, uh, marvelous uh, and uh, I'm very grateful for her assistance. And that should answer your question, Tom B, because he wanted to know about your cameraman, Punk Philatelist, AKA Gerard. Go ahead and ask, you know, what you what you'd like to hear more about. Oh yeah, sorry, Megan. Um, I was just wondering what kind of criticism that you've you've copped from uh, people complaining about how you've treated stamp collecting. That was a curious <laughs> little nugget. I'd love to hear more about. Yeah, I mean, it started with how I handle the stamps. Sometimes I'm a, I'm a bit violent with maps and stamps. Um, so in the early days, it was criticizing me just on my collecting style, right? That you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that, which was creative, uh, well, it was constructive criticism, which I really appreciated. But then you get individuals who will say that um, this is not how you collect stamps. Uh, recently, uh, which has come up a few times, you're not really a philatelist. Um, you're just a stamp collector, which I'm used to now. <laughs> we get that quite often. Um, uh, and then criticism about uh, somebody said the channel's boring uh, from a stamp collector standpoint. And I said, well, you know, I appreciate that kind of, of um, uh, constructive criticism, but they never offer a solution or how to improve it. So that's, that's something I've just had to deal with. Uh, and, and then you get the naysayers who say, why bother? Um, nobody collects stamps anymore. And I'm like, wow, we've got a tremendous community online. Come and enjoy, uh, join us uh, and so on. So I get a very interesting mix of, of, of um, different kinds of negative comments. Some of it's very helpful. And some of it leads me down good investigation paths to learning about other stuff. But a lot of it uh, is just people mindlessly um, disliking you for whatever reason. Punk's like, yeah, I, I know that. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. been a bit of that before. <laughs> I speak that language. Tom Bowman would like to ask a question. Hey, Graham, how you doing? I enjoy your stuff, first of all, but has this virus kind of corrupted your travel ideas? I mean, you're, you're stuck <laughs> filming outside Jersey. Yeah, so I had amazing timing with season three because um, I had filmed the uh, windmill video right, uh, I think I filmed it back in August or September and just had the raw footage stored away um, while I was producing the other videos. And as the virus hit, I, um, I uh, finished up my filming and just started editing the, that one more episode. And now I haven't had to travel since. So I was quite lucky. Had this happened six months earlier, uh, you would have had uh, unfinished season three or a season three that would have just had um, uh, remaining, gr a lot of green screen, you could say, <laughs> at that point. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I mean, I'm not really um, looking to film uh, on set right now. Uh, stepping back a bit, so it hasn't 
really played a part in that, in, in restricting that travel. Instead, I'm focusing on finishing up a few videos, including a, uh, a top 10 countdown um, and a couple of how-tos, which I, I have uh, uh, on the works. Good question. Thank you. Thank you. Tom Bien Yoset from Ohio. You want to unmic yourself or unmute yourself? There we go. Hey, uh, Graham, uh, my club, uh, we, once a month we get together and always part of our program, we watch your videos. So I uh, just want to endorse that. Uh, we really enjoyed the Stamp Tong video and we're wondering if you have any plans along those lines. I, this comes to mind, maybe magnifiers or, I mean, I, I know you, you put a lot of time into it, but what do you think? Stamp albums is something I need to do. So definitely stamp albums. I got to look into it. Uh, granted, there's not going to be no crazy trip to uh, you know Germany like I did for my stamp tongs, which which was a bit much as well. But um, yeah, I definitely want to do a few more of those uh, because I, it's a big ask. Everybody's asking for more about the equipment, especially beginners like myself. Hey, what do you use? Uh, what is the appropriate, um, uh, whether it's an album or magnifying glass or some piece of equipment, what should I be using? So that's how the stamp tong idea came. Is I got a lot of questions about, uh, one, I got told by a lot of people using the wrong tongs uh, and, and stop calling them tweezers. And then also uh, I got a lot of questions of what are the right tongs? So I did a lot of research in that. So, yes, absolutely, uh, that's, that's in the works. Stamp albums is something I'm going to do very soon. <laughs> and I see our young James, he's nodding emphatically, he's excited about that. And James Gates, he is the librarian for the National Baseball Hall of Fame. He's he's up now. Talk to Graham. Thank you, Heidi. And and Graham, I enjoyed this program. And no matter what anybody says, you're a philatelist. Uh, don't ah, believe it. Otherwise. Thank you. <laughs> I, I do work for the Baseball Hall of Fame, and as an institution, we have a YouTube channel on a fairly popular topic um and we're still trying to figure out the youtube algorithm mm. uh, wondering if you've experimented with maybe selecting a stamp that has uh some crossover with other interests uh the thing that comes to mind is elvis presley just to see if you did an elvis presley stamp you put his name if the algorithm would pick that up and maybe draw more traffic to your site yeah um actually that's it brings up a good point is that now and then i mess around with the description and the title uh especially on my less successful episodes to see if by triggering some other word that is a crossover in that sense just like elvis if triggering something else can maybe push it up in the algorithm um one of the things that i i haven't done well enough is uh, is really use the crossover piece in terms of producing a video that is primarily around, for instance, Alvis. But one of the examples is Ella Fitzgerald, my Ella Fitzgerald uh, stamp I pulled from the box. I got very little success with it, very few views, until I changed it because uh, I excluded Ella Fitzgerald's name from it. Then I went back and re uh, redid the title to say Jazz Icon Ella Fitzgerald, and I started to get a much higher average views per month rate on that. People may be searching for Ella Fitzgerald singing, see this, uh, see this video about stamps, might click it instead of just searching for stamps in general. So yeah, uh, that's an element that I, I've, I've played with a bit. Well, if you ever do figure it out, that's worth a whole YouTube video on its own. <laughs> yeah, but then somebody else will take it and then the algorithm will change. <laughs> Charlene Blair adds, uh, and do you add, does adding tags in the channel and videos, does that help you, Graham? Tags don't. So there's, there's, the, um, there's a little box on your video that you can go ahead and add little um, keywords. Apparently that doesn't have much of an impact because I used to slam a lot of words in there. Uh, the description has a big impact and um, you'll find that a lot of YouTube videos will have a very lengthy um, description because people are just trying to cram as much keywords in there as possible. I can trigger it. The title is probably one of the biggest, as well as the thumbnail. So the concern I have with that is that it encourages clickbait. So there's you know, poor quality content, but they make super exciting thumbnails that don't really mirror what the content is, uh, and you go ahead and click it. And remember, if you have a video that somebody clicks on because they're enticed, 
and then they see that it's crummy, they stop watching 30 seconds or a minute into it, and that devalues your score in the algorithm. So it's, there's a lot around it that uh, I wish I could I wish I wish I could figure it out. But yeah, keywords in the description really weigh more than in the in the key box uh, tags. That's a nice segue, Leon. Would you like to unmute yourself and? See you nodding. Oh no. Okay. So Leon is asking from Canada. Besides geographic, what other demographics can you tell us about? Um, that's a good question. Could I even share that? Let's see. I might be. Let's take a look. So if I go to YouTube, I'm gonna give me a second, guys. I might be able to take a look here. Sure. Uh, while while you you're can... while you're messing around i'll read some you know uh punk philatelist says he doesn't begrudge you one bit and we can re-watch you over and over um charlene blair loved your presentation one of your her favorite videos was about attending a stamp show it was her first introduction <laughs> to state park really and charlene who's who's uh, the national museum of african-american on stamps uh, she said that she has the yellow video on her website. Um, let's see what else. Steve and Katie says, I've watched all three seasons and love your show. They're very interesting. His favorite was China. Hmm. China. Very cool. Thank you. Thank you. And so I, I, I just looked at the um, audience. There isn't much. So... I mean, from from a demographic standpoint, it's age and gender is the key one. Um, uh, it's the countries, and it kind of stops there. It goes deep into that though. It goes average views uh, per viewer. Um, it points out wh which of them are subscribed versus not subscribed. Uh, how many of them are using subtitles versus not using subtitles. And so on, but it doesn't really break down the demographics uh, beyond that, and then how engaged and how how am I reaching them? So, unfortunately, that's where that's where the insight stops. Uh, he would also like to know, um, same gentleman, Mr. Mathis, if you have any plans to Canada, Toronto specifically. To go to Canada? Well, I've gone to Toronto, uh, which was a very exciting time. I went to the um, I walked the entirety of the Toronto Islands, uh, which were to try get a shot of a scene of Toronto to match the skyline of a stamp. And at the end of the day, it didn't match at all. And so I had to completely change that video around. But so I have been to Toronto. I love Canada. I've been to Canada a few times, uh, primarily Toronto area. Uh, so I'd love to go again, of course. Uh Evan Two would like to know what was your favorite episode to produce. Ah, uh, favorite episode to produce. So I had a lot of fun with a non-episode, the Tongs Tweezers. I had a lot of fun with the stamp shows, both of them, Stampex, and um, uh, when I went uh, to Columbus, Ohio, uh, for that stamp show, the APS stamp show. Uh, from an episode standpoint. The, probably the most fun was Aruba because of what happened. That was genuine. A donkey came out of nowhere, and uh, I had to guide this donkey using an apple at my backpack to try and mimic a stamp, and I, I, I had so much fun doing that. And then after filming that, what you don't know is that I was also using that scene. Straight after that, um, I drove down and found a, a pretty cool beach where I jumped in the water and pretended I was in the Virgin Islands for an episode. And so I walked out of the beach there. So then I was dripping wet, got back in the car, and then uh, used the drone and flew all over Aruba to get the final shots of Aruba. And that was all done in, in uh, a span of 14 hours. So uh, I would say that was probably the most fun uh, to do, Aruba with a t tie into the uh, Virgin Islands episode. Letting you in on my secrets now. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well. Drones and the whole bit. Yeah. <laughs> CJ, why don't you go ahead and unmute yourself, hon? 
Oh, I wanted to ask about your stock footage or your stock music usage. Mm -hmm. Do you usually buy as part of a package or do you individually pick your pieces and get the licenses? I wish I did a package up front because every time I said, ah, this will be the only thing I need to buy. I don't need to buy a package. Uh, and so I wish I did like one of those packages you pay up front and then you can you can burn it out while you pick footage. But um, I buy them individually. I, I search for music and stock footage in a number of different sites, primarily Pond5 and Shutterstock. I bounce between those two a lot. But then I also look for any archived uh, public domain uh, footage. So a lot of, some of my videos, you'll see some very old footage that's free. But you've got to find it and you've got to make sure that it's um, uh, copyright removed. And some of that, sometimes you need like the artist to be dead for 70 years in order to use it. Or um, it's just footage that they can't identify who the actual owner is. And uh, you can go to a website called archive.org. That's a really cool one where you can find some, some content like that. Which one is that, Thank Graham? You. Which one? Archive.org. That's where I, I... <laughs> Heidi's taking notes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there we go. Archive.org. Yeah, that's a cool one. Uh, you can look through um, photos uh, and content like that, music as well. Uh, Penny saying that that stamp tongue video saved her life. So thank you. Oh, I got cool. Good. Did you ask about uh, did, CJ? Did you ask about music? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I'm reading the. I'm, multitasking here okay um melanie rogers would like to know have you tried to post on other video sites like vimeo i have not no it's something i've thought about i just never got around to it um whether or not posting on vimeo i see there are a few um people that are posting my videos on other platforms uh, and creating the whole exploring stamps uh, channel which uh, I should probably get on and, and investigate a bit. But no, I haven't gone to Vimeo or any other video platform other than YouTube. I've primarily kept it there. Well, with how many billions a minute or an hour, you said? How many? Yeah, a billion hours are watched every day, and then 500 hours of video are uploaded every minute. It's kind of crazy. That is crazy. Little J Young James, Youngblood James, you, got a, you have a question. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Oh yeah, yeah. So I have I have two questions. Um, so in your Chinese New Year um, stamp with the baby monkey, and then the two monkeys, the for the two yeah. child homes, Where did you get the, uh, yeah. the the specialty albums, or just any kind of specialty album in general? Oh, that one I surfed for um, days looking for. Actually, I think months searching for, for that. And eventually I found that one, I think, on eBay, a specialty album. Um, it's amazing because you can refresh now and then. I go to uh, the three key places that I go looking for con uh, for materials in, in terms of philatelic stamps and all that is Hip Stamp, um, uh, eBay, and uh, the stamps.org website. And I bounce between those three, and then I refresh later, and I see if anybody's posted anything new, and so on. That's primarily where I've been. I don't overcomplicate it, so, so yeah. What, what was the uh, the third website? Uh, if you go to stamps, it was the third oh, one I said, stamps.org? Stamps. Yes, yeah, so if you go to stamps.org, there's a stamp store. Stamps. Right, we have, we have a stamp store too, Jane. We have Yep, that's it. So yeah, Heidi, if you post that uh, the stamps store in the in the chat, because that's actually a very helpful one. And since they've recently upgraded, I'm not doing a plug for APS here. I'm just saying I use it. Uh, if, if you they, APS they work, you can plug it all you want, buddy. Well, I'm uh, yeah. And that's how that's how much I use it. I I actually will plug it here. <laughs> so um, uh, it's brilliant and. And what's really cool is that they package the, the stuff really well. It's probably the best of all of them. Get a lot of cool stamps on the outside of of, uh, uh, of the um, envelope that they send my way. So, yeah. But then eBay, you can find some really good stuff and you can find a lot of bad stuff. So you got to be careful on eBay. Uh, the buyer be warned. You can find a lot of I've, – I've stumbled across and have purchased a number of fakes. So just FYI, they're out there and there's plenty of them. And uh, do you – on eBay or sites? Sorry, say it again, James. 
Sorry, say again, Jay? Do you ever sell things on no. eBay or different sites to like make up for no. the production cost so it evens out a bit? You're a genius, James. I really should be doing that. And that would have probably helped offset a tremendous amount of the costs. Uh, no, I have not. Maybe that's something I should be doing and could start doing now. I step back a bit about from the video production because, like you said, it would offset some of the costs. I buy the stuff and then I'm just storing it right now. If I was actually selling them, uh, I wouldn't have such a heavy expense. Smart man. Uh, let's see who else here. Do, 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 do. Uh, Leon Mathis again, our friend joining us from Toronto, Canada, wants to know: Do you play the guitar piece in the intro? Yes, I do. Uh, two things there. I'm terrible at the guitar, uh, and that was a copyright concern. Was I kept stumbling across? Uh, well, making the pilot uh, songs that even though I purchased for a short sting, a uh, short little uh, piece, kept getting hit on, on YouTube for copyright and even though I bought them. So I got frustrated and I said, fine, I'll show you. I'll make my own music. Went and got a guitar and realized how difficult playing the guitar is. And so <laughs> uh, those, all those chords really took a long time to get right. Uh, and um, I am extremely proud of that little song that is at the front of the episodes. <laughs> Look at you, what a renaissance man. That's terrific. <laughs> and Leon would also like to know, Graham, mm. how, how do we find you on social? What are your handles? Just look for Exploring Stamps. I exist on Twitter and on Instagram. Those are the two ones that I have a lot of fun on and then of course i'm on youtube so yeah i play on instagram and uh, twitter you can just search for explorer stamps everyone can read over here we have we, we, we hear considered patreon or ko-fi yeah the problem i have with patreon uh or any kind of um you know pooling of funds from from an audience is that then there's expectations that i have to meet and the problem with that then is that it stresses me out and i've been quite free of expectations because i can say well you know what i'm not going to make any more videos or you know what? i'm going to make a two minute video this time or you know what i'm not going to listen to my audience who's begging for this particular video i'm just going to make a video about whatever i want uh so there's the problem is that with you when you start um getting money from people and although that probably would have helped tremendously i then have to work within some constraints uh, some expectation level, understanding that people would be disappointed perhaps. Perhaps that's too much thinking on my part, but I've always been free to do whatever I want. Uh, even when the APS uh, reached out and said, how can we help you and sponsor you? They gave me a tremendous level of freedom and saying, there's no expectation, just go for it. And so I've been able to benefit uh, with my creativity in that sense. Do you, uh, Tom Bowman, I'm going to read it for you, Han. Do you find that the more negative comments are from serious collectors? I mean, are you able to whittle that down? Yeah, they are. Um, it's more serious collectors, uh, traditional yeah, collectors. Laughing I, at. Yeah, I, and I really appreciate their point of view. Um, but, you know, there, there's, there's a level of change management or level of understanding of change. And I fully get it. My profession, I deal with change and uh, change management, project management. So I'm, I'm used to that. And it makes complete sense uh, why, why I would get negative comments from them. So, yeah, the traditionalist, the, the very serious collector uh, is typically the one who gives me a negative comment. You know, I, I found that at the, yeah, at the stamp shows that I go to, if I approach somebody, and, which you don't know me, but I go up to everybody, hey, how you doing? You know, and sometimes you get, oh, I'm doing good. And you get a, what do you want? You know, <laughs> I thought I wouldn't. But, uh, no, absolutely, absolutely. I, I've been at stamp shows, I've held a camera out, and some people have said, absolutely, do not film me, do not film my stamps. Um, this isn't uh, this isn't a kid's playground, you know. Uh, I've gotten statements like that. I've been like, excuse me, okay, fine. <laughs> um, it's 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 very interesting, and um, 
I've been slightly disheartened by some of the comments that I've seen other people receive. I've seen a nice, um, uh, uh, I've seen a, I've seen a woman approach a stamp booth at a at um, at a stamp show with her um, her mother's stamp collection, which she recently passed away, and literally get told by the stamp dealer. Literally said that if you put a gun to my head, I wouldn't even give you ten dollars for this. This is all rubbish. And I was like, wow, that's not the kind of comment that you should be giving out there. You're not really painting a good picture or welcoming picture for anybody who might be interested in stamp collecting or now would, you know, like perhaps maybe pursue um, learning more about their, their mother's collection. So, uh, yeah, they, that's the negative side. At the same time, the traditionalists, the experts have a tremendous amount of knowledge and learning from them is can be very rewarding so it's it's a balance can i how can i tap into that knowledge how can i excite them into the channel without getting told off or uh, without getting um concerned with their statements so yeah sorry that was a bit long no 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 <laughs> i think everybody wanted to hear that graham it's true there's a lot of peacemaking and diplomacy and uh aps uh, executive director scott english would like to remind us all that stamp collectors are philatelists okay so we can own that word. Punk, we're gonna, exactly, big thumbs up. We've got one more, uh, some engines. Everybody's giving you the thumbs up on that one, that's right. Uh, Punk, we've got one, we've got a little bit of time, go ahead and uh, go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, sorry, another one. Um, I'm not a huge fan of Facebook ethically, but I'm just wondering, is there a reason why you, you don't have a, an official Facebook presence, especially given that it's such a big video platform these days? It is. It's um, my con my issue is that it's just too much. Uh, so I picked my battles with Twitter and Instagram very early on. I said these are the two, and I just didn't have the time to manage another platform. It, it, it's it's amazing how much energy that can take from you. Even though I really enjoy using the platform, you know, um, I start my weekends going okay. The chore list is I got to answer emails. There's lots and some I can't answer. That I got to go and address my Twitter and I got to address the Instagram and then I can start writing the script. And after I've done all that, as I'm writing the script, my Twitter's going off again. And then I said, well, I got to go do the Twitter. And can you imagine Facebook was part of that? I would just go nuts. It's just, yeah. and, and I'm not the best with time management either. <laughs> yeah, uh, fair enough. It's also probably the nastiest of the platforms really in, in what way well i think so just in terms of the trolls you attract and the the fights oh. that can break out and you have to yeah, kind of manage and, all that DMS. I, and i noticed that twitter can be like that if you veer any way outside of your particular um community and so you've got to avoid politics and you've got to avoid all the other stuff but i i have heard i don't think um uh, james gavin did a very good piece of, about how you can get a lot of um, trolls, like you said, or people just coming and saying, "Hey, I have a stamp collection. How do, how much is it?" That's a that's yeah. a big email. That's my popular email subject line. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> and then I send them to you, Graham. <laughs> Thanks. Visa. Thanks, Heidi. Thanks. <laughs> Well, friends, it is 8.04. We, this is an unprecedented going over from the Swiss watch that we usually like to have here on APS Camp Chat. But it, you're, it's so passionate, and uh, I can tell that everybody was having a great time. Thank you so much, Graham. And I'd like you to take a few moments and read the chat box while I... Uh, I say our salutations, friends. Thank you for joining us on APS Stamp Chat. It was really a good time, and uh, you know, despite naysayers, I think that the the biggest uh, uh, the qualities of philatelists and stamp collectors are uh, are connection and collecting and, and uniting, really. So remember, that's one percent that nastiness. There's a ton of good stuff, and and we're all gathered here because of our love of philately and because of your videos, Graham. They've really helped inspire. They're very easy to shoot off and they've got delightful mass appeal. So thank you. If you are not an APS member, friends, I highly recommend that you boogie on over to stamps.org. Take a look at the AP, the American Philatelist, the APRL. Those are access, those are available to you, non-members, until the June 1. So you're going to want to get over to that site, check it out, and then send in 
your money. We've got various uh, memberships, including our 25 for under 30 year olds. We have a digital subscription. So there's a price point to meet you wherever you're at. Um, and remember, you're becoming a part of 134 tradition, year year old tradition, but you're also becoming a part of this global network of uh, lifelong learners and peacemakers. So I wish you all a very good night. Thanks again, Graham. Thank you to all of our members. Thank you here that have, have been a guest also. We really appreciate that. Our next camp chat is on Monday at three o'clock. We will have part two with Dr. John Node coming from Calgary on dinosaurs. And then at seven o'clock, we'll be meeting with Mr. Leon Reed talking about the Civil War. So thanks, Graham. And go ahead and I hope that you read your chat. Everybody look at each other and Bit aloha, Shabbat shalom. Thank you so much, everyone. I had a lot of fun and the questions were great. So um, I really appreciate it. Thank you for joining this call. Thank you, everybody. Stay healthy, collecting. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Okay, thank you.